Game two, 2009 conference finals. The block in game seven. Game six, <laughs> Ray <laughs> Allen's three. You guarded it four straight finals. Yep. What are your thoughts on how to defend it? In order for us to reach our potential, CB will have to go to the five. All I need is a little adjustment from the offensive player, and I promise you I'll track it down. Do not foul. Kawhi's guarding me. <laughs> You're like, what, what did I do? This? What did I what did do, I do to, deserve, to this? deserve this? Ray backpedals, doesn't even look at the line. What if he step what if he steps on the line? It's what not, if his toes on the line? What if his toes yeah, on the yeah. line? And I felt like if I could get AR and instill AR and that confidence in that fourth quarter to make plays and win that game, it was just gonna pay dividends for the rest of my time with him and the rest of his time when I'm not with him. Oftentimes, mental mistakes within a game can lead to a series loss. For sure. He throws it from the sideline, I bounce all the way across, I close out, slips, falls on the ground, KD dunks the ball. The biggest example of like luck in the postseason. In your, in your experience. I mean, I was on the team, that's the luck, right? I mean, <laughs> Game six. I don't know how I forgot. Ray that. Allen's three. Yeah, I don't. The sequence of events here. Yeah. Yep. That led up to that. Yep. I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind is that, you know, Pop had took Timmy D out. Yeah. You know, and I think because, you know, they could probably was looking to switch everything because we needed threes. We needed threes. So a lot, everything was going to be on the perimeter. I had literally just made one three before that. And uh, we ran one of our plays that we've been practicing all year where I would, you know, Come and set the pick. Like we just kind of like we drew up on a whiteboard. I would, I would flare over the top and then come back. And uh, I I missed that one. And who knows if Timmy D's on the floor? Does he clean glass? He's cleaned glass a lot in his career. But Bosch is able to you know get the rebound over Manu. Manu kind of falls down a little bit. He's kind of on the back. He cleans glass and then Ray backpedals. Doesn't even look at the line. What if he step? What if he steps on the line? Backpedaling. What if he what steps if, on the baseline? What if his toes on the line? What if his toes yeah, yeah, on the yeah. line? There's some a lot of preparation because I watch Ray do that every day, prep yeah, yeah. like that. But I believe there's some luck to that too. The thing I always think about that play, and this is gonna sound weird and it's gonna make me look bad. <laughs> it will, but I will take it. Manu was such a fucking psychotic competitor. I think about him going for that rebound. If I was in that situation and saw the ball bounce, and this is not revisionist history, I'm just being honest with you. I'm staying at home. But Manu is Manu. He wants that rebound to close he want, the game. He wanted to tip it out. Yep. He wanted to close the game close out, the game. win a championship. Yep. Like, I'm not, this is, I'm not knocking what he did. No, no, for sure, yeah. And had he not fallen, it wouldn't even have mattered. Right. But he's such a competitor, he mm -hmm. went for it, and he fell, he fell and, and that was him. all that Ray needed. That's all he needed. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I'm soft. <laughs> Thanks, Manu. <laughs> uh, end game, game two, one of your most iconic shots. What game? Game two, 2009 conference finals. Oh, yeah. Over Orlando. Yeah. I have a question about that play. Because that is an example of a, you know, off, off ball movement, catch and shoot three. Yep. Yeah. So, if I remember correctly, um, Mo was taking it out. Yep. Delante set like a flare screen for Ogalskis. Yep. Right, right here. I think it was Pavlovich just kind of ran to the ball. Yep. And you were over here on this elbow. You actually never got a screen on that play. No, because I was supposed to, the play was for to fake up and go back door for the lob. And Turk played okay. it, and Turk played it per perfectly. Okay. So I faked up, and I tried to go back for the lob, and I said it's not open. It's not open. So I just came to the ball, and and Turk fucked that up. Yeah. My only issue on that play, I didn't even see Richard. He had a hell of a contest. Yes. He was guarding the ball. He was guarding Mo. Yeah. Yeah. He was guarding the ball. I didn't see until after the fact. I never saw him. I never saw him, but you only I, saw Turk. I only saw Turk. Do saw you remember? Him. Do you remember your first playoff game? My first playoff game, I do. 
What do you remember about it? I was nervous as fuck. That's what I remember. This was third year? This was third year. Third year. Yeah, and I don't and I don't know. I mean, we can look it up and figure out when was the last time the Cavs were in the postseason. But that was just like my first year, okay. I was like established myself in my first year. Second year, we missed the playoffs by maybe one or two games. And it's like, okay, I'm here to like play ball, but I want to make the next step. I gotta get this franchise to the postseason. And my third year, we finally made the postseason, and we our first game was against Washington at home. I was nervous as hell. My stomach was hurting all goddamn long, all day until, literally until the, until the ball jumped. Why do Why do you think? Like, what, what have you reflected on that? Why Why do you think you were more nervous for that want... game than any other game? Well, it's two games. My first ever game in Sacramento, and then I, I didn't want to fucking lay an egg. I think Obviously, what you're, I, everybody was watching. This is not a narrative podcast. So I just want to be clear on this. But I think what you're admitting here is that you 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 felt the burden. You felt the pressure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Pressure. Who's under more pressure? Yeah, who is it? What's pressure? <laughs> what is pressure? No, I didn't want to lay an egg, man. I was, what, 20, 20 years old. Got the team to the postseason. I didn't want to go out there and shit the bed. I was maybe 21, maybe. But, like, I didn't want to shit the bed. First playoff game, you know, look out there's Gilbert Arenas and Antoine Jameson and Karam Butler and those guys. They were playing great ball that year. We are inexperienced as hell. Um, I didn't want to lay an egg. What'd you have? 32-11-11. I laid an egg, all right. Oh, man. In their locker room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I think I, yeah. I don't quote me on this. I think it was like thirty-five, seven, and six, or thirty-five, seven, and seven, or something. Well, for the whole series. For the whole series. Yeah. Oh shit. Not bad. No, not bad. Not not, not bad, bad for, for the first one. You've played in uh, a ton of playoff games. Obviously, you've, you've won championships. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot that's different about the playoffs in the regular season. What is it? What is different about the playoffs? In general or in, for me? In, in general. In general. We'll get to you specifically. Um, in general, um, as you know, as you've played in a lot of postseason games too, one possession can lose you the series. And compared to the regular season, you can get away with some slippage. You can get away. It's four and five nights. Fucking tired. You know, it's a cold ass Tuesday night in Milwaukee. You know, you're like, holy shit. Not this Milwaukee team, I mean. Obviously, you get up for those guys, but in the postseason, one bad stretch. It could be a fucking 6 0 run. It could be a turnover here. It could be you didn't top, you didn't top lock JJ when we told you we top locking him all series. And now he didn't see one go in. Even if you, there's times like where you, you know, you could win a playoff game. And because the way you finished the game, you already lost the second one. Mm. You don't let, you don't let that fucking guy or that person get into a rhythm in the fourth quarter because you decided you didn't want to lock in for eight to nine more minutes. And yes, we won the game. But now we may lose the war. The block in game seven. Okay. Of 2016. Okay. Take me through what proceeded on the offensive end to your mindset in that chase down. If, if my mind is serving me right, both teams can score. Three, three, four, three minutes, three, four minutes of game, of actually game time. So, when you're in the game, it actually feels like it's fucking 25, 30 minutes. Um, I think it was 89, 89 at the time, if I'm not mistaken. And at that point in time, I felt like Kyrie could get us the best shot. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Kyrie drove, got a great look, shot up a floater. And I'm sitting in the corner by their bench. I'm opposite of Kyrie. I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting in the corner by their bench. In my head, I said, if I'm correct with the, traje- with the trajectory of the ball, what I'm seeing, 
I got to get my ass back. Because Iggy's going to be on a sprint, Steph's going to be on a sprint, and we're outnumbered. Because I'm below the free throw line, Tristan's below the free throw line, Kyrie's shooting the ball, he's below the free throw line. And all I can see is, all I see is, is swish, JR. I said, I got to get back. So as soon as the ball, when the ball is missed, I didn't, I didn't, if I was to follow my coach's orders or coach's orders, you're supposed to get back on the race. On the release, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the release, get back on the release. I did not get back on the release. I did not get, I didn't start to actually get back until I actually saw it was a miss, but in my mind, I could see the ball feeling like it was gonna be a little long. I just hauled ass, man. I just hauled ass, and when I'm running, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know who it was that I kind of like, kind of run around, I don't know who it was, I don't know if it was a Golden State player or, or one of our guys, I kind of had to run around or, or, or move around, because I was in the left corner and Iggy Sider on the right side. But when I'm running, all I'm telling myself, I'm like, swish, do not follow him. So you can ask any of my teammates throughout the course of my career or throughout the course of that season, anytime that you see me trailing the play, all I need is a little adjustment from the offensive player, and I promise you I'll track it down. Do not fucking foul. Do not fucking foul. I told the guys all year, if you see me hauling ass, just make him, instead of just going in for a layup, make him change it a little bit, just a little bit. And, and Switch gets a lot of shit today right? because of the blunder he had yeah, the following yeah, yeah. year or two years later or whenever the fuck it was of not understanding the, the time and score, whatever the case may be. He executed that shit to perfection. He made Iggy change his shot just a little bit, and that's all I asked. It's interesting because I went up with both hands too. By the way, I was ready. No, you hit the you hit I, the rim with your left. Hand. I was ready yeah. for the reverse or the strong side, and I was like, if these fucking refs call goal ten, I might get kicked out of this most important game of my life because it was still over two minutes, and they couldn't you couldn't review back then unless it was under two minutes because I knew I had got it clean. That's all I was telling myself. I said, I'm getting this shit. So many of your chase downs, by the way, is you you do your little run. You know, you, I'm just saying, bro. <laughs> I'm not I'm not an impressionist. But <laughs> you do your little run, uh, and then it's like the quick burst. You know what I mean? That was different, though. That was uh, that was like once you said, "Okay, I got to go get this." That was like, yeah, I've got. I don't have time. A, a little window. Yeah. To get there. Yeah. It was different. Like the last leg of the fucking four by one relay were like. Fucking the same boat. I was like, I gotta fucking go. I have been wanting to have this conversation with you for so many years because yep. I have said the Golden State post splits, specifically with that team, is like the hardest action to guard. Yep. I was doing research on something else the other day, and I was looking up because uh, I was for a Boston game because Porzingis has the highest efficiency in the tracking era for points per direct post up. Yep. Right. He's every time they switch. Smaller guy on him. So he's what? mashing, whatever. Draymond was at the top of the list for a bunch of years. In 1819, he had the highest efficiency on post ups of any player in the NBA. And you're like, well, Draymond doesn't score in the post. But they're throwing him the ball, and either Steph and Claire run their action. We yep. saw back in 22, Wiggins would be the screener, slip for the yep. dunk. Yep. They also involved the big. So yep. Steph and Claire doing their little dance. Yep. Looney then Looney, comes and cleans yep, it up. Yep, because right. the big that's guarding Looney gonna is drop. sitting in the damn paint. Yep, yep, exactly. It's the hardest thing to guard. Yep, you guarded it four straight finals. Yep. What are your thoughts on how to defend it? When Draymond catches the ball in the post, the one thing, the first thing you have to do, you have to track his eyes. You can't track the ball because Draymond has the ability. What they kind of they they started to take out in our league is a swipe through. So obviously he has his back towards the basket. You have to track his eyes because if you track the ball with your hand, he'll go underneath your arms. He used to get that foul. The second thing you have to do, you have to get the bodies right away. And you can't get to the top side because Steph and Clay are great at back doors and get to the rim. You have to get to the lower hip of them. And who's ever setting the screen 
has to give a little space so you don't allow it to slip. And the guy that's guarding, either Steph or Clay, that's coming off, you have to get to the bottom hip of their shoulder and trail them all the way out. The two most important people in the whole thing is the two guys that's weak side. Mm. When they have those, when they have certain shooters out there, it's very difficult. But nine times out of ten, when we were playing them in the finals, it was at times it was JaVel McGee and Igadala. It was Andrew Bogut, Sean Livingston, and Sean Livingston, Harrison Barnes. When everything went haywire, <laughs> when it was fucking Kevin Durant over there and another shooter, it was like impossible to guard because you couldn't help from the weak side because now Draymond's such a great IQ player. If you help, if you tag from the guy on the weak side, he throws it all the way across court. You can actually see, there's a play that you can watch on YouTube probably where they were taking the ball out on SOB. You know, Side out of bounds. Yeah, not son of a bitch. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Side out of bounds. And I was getting ready. I was 2 nining on the strong side because they were about to get into some split action. Steph takes the ball out and throws it all the way to the weak side corner by their bench. And I try to close out the KD because I'm looking, trying to shrink the floor. He throws it from the sideline out of bounds all the way across. I close out, slips, falls on the ground. KD dunks the ball. So let's say you involve K- Kevon Looney or whatever. Yep. And so the big decides to like you know be in a drop back here. Yep. So Steph and Clay they're up here doing yep. their dance or whatever. Yep. Um, they're going to get an open three. Yep. Right. Yep. If you switch out with Kevon Looney's guy, I think what's always been difficult for me is someone who's guarded that action. You were talking about body position. Yep. Bro, sometimes it doesn't matter. They're so good. The second you get on that angle, the second you turn your head, the cutting to the basket is the hardest part to me. Yep. Like I can chase over a screen and get a contest on a three. But like they're just they 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 keep you off balance, which is interesting that you bring up the weak side being the key to the whole thing. But you that's that's like what you're saying is advanced basketball IQ. You know what it's you're saying if I'm going Draymond in the post, Kevon Looney is at the quad. They're doing their thing. At the, the free throw line. They're doing their thing. Yeah. You're saying that if he has a wide open three, why not? Are you saying Draymond's man just go take and then Kevon Looney just stays in the paint? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I'm saying as, as, as this guy. Right. As one of them. Yep. So we can switch this action. Yep. Let's say we're switching this yep. action. I'm saying if Kevon Looney is so worried, he's in this, his guy's in this drop, right. and he's off the body, we're going to live with the contested three. Yep, yep. Right? You're going to give that up if you're worried about taking the layup. Yeah, for the sure. The second you bring Kevon Looney up, they're getting a layup. Yeah, for sure. They're getting a layup. Yeah, you're going to lay up. They're too, it's too yeah, yeah. hard to guard. Yeah. The dance is too hard. Right. And they've done it yeah, so many right. times. You're absolutely right. You go back to that 22, dude, that 22 finals run. Where they just like, all right, so Wiggins is getting guarded by whoever. Draymond's got the ball, and we're just going to involve two people. We're not even going to put the big in there. Yeah. How many cuts did Wiggins get? He runs into the to the, to the split action and doesn't and even sli- stop. He doesn't even stop. Straight to it. And it's a layup. And you know what's interesting? You think about that that run. You talking about getting in the playoffs? You can't beat high basketball IQ teams with a low basketball IQ team. No, there's no. And way. at the time. Some of those teams I didn't think were, were high basketball IQ teams. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's interesting. Aaron Gordon talked about that because they, they beat them in the first round, and that was a big takeaway for me. Now, they didn't have the personnel. They didn't have KCP, right? right? They didn't have the personnel. Murray was hurt. Mm-hmm. But it, I'm not saying – I don't, would never say a guy's dumb. I'm saying basketball IQ. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They got outsmarted that series. Yeah. Jokic was a monster, all that stuff, but they got outsmarted. They got outsmarted. Mm-hmm. And Aaron Gordon has talked about – Coming off of that series, being like, I gotta, I gotta become a smarter basketball yeah. player. Yeah, T- to win at the highest to level. To win at the highest level, and he did it. Um, I think the other, the other thing for me in in playing and in watching is, can you create good offense down the stretch? That's true, mm. of course, in any basketball game. Yeah, I think it's 
harder and harder the further you go in the playoffs. Yeah, it is. I mean, obviously the the, <clears throat> the IQ, which I always come to, the IQ from the coaches to the players heighten and get better as you go on and on and on and on. And once the players get better too as well, I feel like being able to execute, certain, certain guys are able to execute better than others and teams or whatever the case may be because nothing, nothing bothers them in the, in the pressure moments. Sometimes the lights are too bright yeah. for certain individuals. And you know, I, 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 w- he, he, I would say this, though. Here's the thing. That's a fair point. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> not disagreeing. <laughs> for my career, I think I shot 41% in the regular season from three. For my career in the playoffs, I think I shot over 37%. Yeah, but that's not because of the pressure. No, no, no. But, I, but hold on. Oftentimes, our, our, our opinion on things are, are shaped by our own experience. Is that fair? That's fair. Let you and I have had different experiences as basketball players. Let me hear your right? experience. So later on in my career, once, pretty much once I got to L.A. and was like a starter and third or fourth option on offense, you get to the playoffs, they treat you like a first option. Yeah, for sure. Do you, know, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, like they've, yeah. they've come up with a very specific game plan. The same team mm-hmm. for game one, game two, game three, mm-hmm. through game seven. Yep. They've come up with a specific game plan for you. So Utah Jazz 2017, we are going to top lock him as soon as he crosses half court. I mean, Dr. Rivers said to me after game one, he said, this is not your series. I need you to stand in the corner. <laughs> right? A terrible series. It was the worst series of my fuck. In my, in my like playing career of when I was like actually a player, not not like a bench guy, but like right. it was the worst series of my career. But he was like, you got to go stand in the corner. They're literally, we're playing four on four without you. I'm like, all right, right? The closeouts. So if I do create separation or if you do make a mistake in the kick, the closeouts are different in the playoffs. Yes. So my catch and shoot time to get a clean release is different. I'm not making excuses. No, I'm just telling you <clears throat> it is the truth what I experienced. So do you think because of that by the way, 37% is not horrible. No, hell it's no. It's not good. Horrible. It's not good for me. I mean for I'm you upset. it's not it's terrible. It's, you, it's terrible. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible for it's you. It's terrible. I mean for the average guy <laughs> I'm embarrassed. They, they will fucking <laughs> I'm embarrassed. They might get a max contract over that. But for you you should yeah. But that's why I, I believe certain guys once the postseason start because they've been guarded a certain way for what September to mid-April a certain way you know you have certain games that that gets you know circled on the calendar that certain coaches get up for certain players get up for but at the end of the day you've been guarded a certain way and then in the postseason like you said the closeouts are different the preparation is different guys guys are they're, they're not allowing you to do what you do best because at the end of the day, if certain guys get off on a team, you're definitely going to lose. If I'm playing the Clippers, you got, okay, you got to deal with Blake and his points in the paint and his rolls and his pocket passes from CP. You got to deal with CP. You got to deal with Jamal coming off the bench and, and doing what he does off the bench. If we allow JJ to get five or six threes, the series is over. If you shoot, if you can five or not, not fuck making five or six threes. If JJ shooting five or six threes, we're gonna lose. Yeah. The the Spurs series in fifteen. I remember, dude. Right, we come out game one. We're in LA. We've got the three seed. They got the six seed, even though we had the same amount of wins. And Kawhi's guarding me. <laughs> And I'm like, You're like what, what, the did fuck is this? what did I what do? What did I do to deserve, to deserve this? this? <laughs> Why are you guarding me? And for I don't remember, maybe the first four or five games of the season, he started on me. Danny started on CP. Right. Then they switched that in game six. I think it was game. I know game seven. Danny yeah. was on me. Um, and at the end of the series, we win. And like, I didn't have a great series, right. but I had big moments in the series. You know, and at the end of the series, Chip England came up to me. He was like, "Man, our our entire thing was like, we got to, we can't allow you to get off." See, I wasn't. We even threw a part the of ki- that. kitchen sink to you. Yeah, I wasn't even a part of it. I've seen Pop 
in the postseason. I played against him multiple times in finals appearances. There was one time where where soon it, the he called a timeout with like eleven minutes and fifty two seconds left in the first quarter because a guy on our team got off a three. Yeah, I don't even know if they made the damn three, but he called a timeout right away. <sighs> got on Danny Green. What the fuck? Danny Green got on his ass, took him out, brought him back in. But obviously they had something in place and then they execute. Yeah. It seems like you're more content at this stage in your career to like, I'm going to pick and choose my spots about when I'm the primary creator. And yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, I, I, yeah, it comes with trust. It comes with trust too. Um, obviously last year in the Memphis series, um, AR um, gained a lot of trust from me, um, but also had trust in him to make the plays I believe it was game three, maybe, or game two. I think they had home court. Yeah, they had home court. So it was either game one or game two, where in the fourth quarter, I, you know, just was like, AR, let's go win it for us. You know, and I wanted to see, like, it's, I play a lot of chess, not in real life. I, I've actually, you know, a lot of people have told me you should look, you should play chess because you'll be great. I've never played chess, but in, my, play, mind, in, yeah, in my mind, yeah, in theory, yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. like I play chess on the floor. Yeah. And I felt like if I could get AR and instill AR and that confidence in that fourth quarter to make plays and win that game, it was just going to pay dividends for the rest of my time with him and the rest of his time when I'm not with him. You know, I, I, want, I, I love seeing the success of my teammates more than anything. Like, and so to have the ability now to be just like, I pick my spots, hey, D-Lo, you got it. You know, AR, you got it. You know, um, you know, it means a lot, not, not only for me, but for our ball club. The mental side of the playoffs, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Particularly uh, against a really good opponent. Yeah. I think it was in episode one, you said, the further you go into playoffs to win, yeah. you have to be a high IQ team. Yep. It's, uh, it's obviously emotionally draining. Mm-hmm. Because of the, there is pressure. It's different. You feel more with each win and loss. Mm -hmm. You get to two losses in a series. You get mm -hmm. to three losses mm -hmm. in a series. An elimination game. It's you're down three two. You've got to go on the road to San Antonio. They won the championship last year. You've got to muster up enough yeah. to beat them to get back home. Yep. That emotional toll is a lot. The physical toll, of course, playing. But right. To right. me, like the mental side of it, I think that is a huge separator because oftentimes mental mistakes within a game can lead to a series loss. For sure. I think about one I made. I was in Orlando. We were playing in the conference finals against Boston and I had played a good game. And there was a timeout. Let's say there was 29 seconds. There was a, a five or six second difference between shot mm -hmm. clock and game clock and go to the timeout. I know we have a timeout. I know we have a timeout. We get the stop. I get the rebound. You dribble. First, no. First, I looked at Stan. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying it was his fault. Right. I looked. I knew there was a timeout. Mm -hmm. I knew I, I should have called a timeout. And I looked at him, and, and he looked, didn't do anything. Uh, so then I just instinctively put the ball on the floor, and then he called a timeout. Yeah, and now you can't advance the ball. So now we got three seconds, and we've got to take it out three-quarter court, opposite yep. foul line. Yep. And we didn't get a good shot off. Mm -hmm. Now, we were down. Yep. I don't know that we, we right. win anyways, but that's an example right, of right, like right, a right, mental right. mistake. Yeah. I'll give you another one. And this one has bothered me for four years. <laughs> and I'm not throwing this guy under the bus because I think his intention was right. Um. 2020 playoffs, conference finals, you guys are up 1-0 on Denver. And you're down at the end of the game. You've got the ball underneath the basket. Yep. Mason Plum Plumlee checks in the game yep. to guard Anthony Davis. Yep. You are on the left elbow. Anthony Davis is on the right elbow. Danny Green makes some cut or whatever. And Anthony Davis runs to the left wing. You never set a pick. In I fact, your back was turned to Anthony Davis and Mason Plumlee. Correct. Because I was just looking at Doe, like, <laughs> give me the ball. I know. And Mason Plumlee po point switched. Yeah, he point, point switched. switched. And Anthony Davis hit the game-winning three. Yeah. 
Now you're down 2-0. Like that stuff, the little tiny plays. It's weird because in the playoffs, I would say the little plays get amplified more. Does that make sense? Yep. Versus a regular season, you go through 82 games. It's It doesn't feel the same way. Yeah. That's why my body language is so bad throughout the regular season. Because I'm trying to gear them up for the postseason. Because they don't understand. Some guys don't understand. Like, it's one play. Like you're saying, one play can be the difference between your ass going home and going to Cabo or Cancun or wherever the hell you're going. Or going to Disneyland or Disney World with the trophy in your hand. Do you think the the sort of game within the game of coaches is different? Meaning? Like, but I don't know. Bob Myers maybe ne- didn't originate this, but I know that he said it at some point. There are 82 game players and then there's 16 game players, right? Do you think that in some ways there are regular season, co- like good regular season coaches versus good playoff coaches. Like how much does coaching matter in the NBA in the playoffs? That matters a lot. Preparation. Prep. How much prep are you getting going into a series to win? You get out there and you're kind of ready for, you know, everything that's going to be thrown at you. And obviously everybody makes adjustments and then you got the great yeah. players that don't matter what type of fucking game plan you got on them, they're going to exploit it no matter what. But as much as you can be prepared going out for a, a, a series, and you know, you know, I change this, you know, that game one is kind of like the filler game, you know. You almost like tell your players, just go out and just fucking play. Like, just go out and play game one. Don't think too much, because if you start thinking too much, now you can't even just like be, you can't even just be a player no more, because now you're just trying to think the game. But me personally, I, 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 want, I want overload. You want overload. I want overload. I want all the information, everything, everybody, every individual, every pros and cons. And I don't do that throughout the 82 game regular season. I'm not, I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time. I, the, the league has changed a lot with practice time, shoot around time, amount of time you spend in the film room. It just has. Yeah, it has. And, you know, I was, I was fortunate. I would say fortunate. Five of my first six years, I played for Stan. I also played for him my, la- you know, my last year in New Orleans. New Orleans but yeah. you, when you talk about the preparation, it was interesting to me that he prepared for a regular season game the same way he prepared for a postseason game. Yeah. So we're in shoot around for an hour and a half. We got knee pads on. We're going live. He would. I remember at the end of shoot arounds, he'd be like, "All right, these guys haven't run this play in five games. This is an ATO, but they haven't run it in five games. But just, we, I want to be prepared for it. Let's go through it. Oh, you guys didn't do it right. Let's go through it again. That's right? the Rouse tree. A hundred percent. That's the Rouse tree. Spoles the same way. So when we got, but my point is, when we got to the playoffs, it didn't feel any different. Right. Because when we were prepping prepared. for a playoff, yeah, for game. sure. That's the Spoles the same way. That's the Rouse tree. You, you know, you come from that Pat Riley tree. That's just you prepare every day like it's your last for sure. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching Mind the Game podcast. If you like it, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you. When you guys got together in Miami, yeah. the conversations with Chris about his role, mm-hmm. but also the decision to sort of move him to the five, which by the way, was not right away. No, it wasn't. Like, was there pushback on that at the time? Do you remember, like, the, those conversations? Because, you know, I, I know UD was was there. Yep. Joel Anthony was there. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, my first year, Big Z was there and Big Eric Z Dampier. And Eric Dampier. That, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to tell you when it all changed. Obviously, my first year there, you know, played great basketball, got all the way to the finals, losing the finals. I play like shit. Um, Spo is the reason why we were a better team and our team was more assembled properly. That summer, he went to Oregon and hung out with Chip Kelly. Oh, interesting. He, he, when we lost to Dallas, he went to Oregon and hung out with Chip Kelly and learned to spread offense and tried to figure out if he could translate that to basketball. 
and don't know the super conversations that him and Chip had. But I know when he came back to us, he knew in order for us to reach our potential, one, I had to be fucking 10 times better than I was in that previous June finals. But Chris Bosh had to go to the five. And CB being who he is, there was no pushback. There was no pushback. He knew in order for us to reach our potential that CB would have to go to the five. And we had to spread. We had to, he had to start working on his corner three faithfully every day after practice. Corner three every day after practice. We're going to post you up. We're going to get you your elbow catches. The offense is going to run through you at times. But in order to bring, you know, the Tyson Chandlers out of the paint, in order to bring the Roy Hibberts out of the paint, in order to bring Tim Duncan out of the paint at times, in order to bring Kevin Garnett out of the paint, you got to hit these corner threes. You got to at least be a threat. And Spo, Spo knew it. He had that, he had that vision. He went and learned. He said, the way I, he said, the way I coached in that finals versus Dallas, unacceptable. I told myself the way I played, unacceptable. And he came back with vengeance and I was all, I, I was locked the fuck in from, from start to finish, but it was Spo. I had a question about the Bosch, Bosch spacing, but because you just said that, was that the low point for you in your career? Oh, for sure. The 2011. Lowest. The lowest. Yeah. Yeah, the lowest. Yeah. The lowest. What is it, what, the Bosch spacing? What did that sort of unlock? I'm, I'm curious. Like, what were the actions? What, what, what was the, the, the two man game? Yeah. What were the reads? The cutting. Slot cut? The slot cut. <laughs> the slot cuts. The slot cuts. It unlocked the slot cuts. It unlocked exactly what myself and D Wade thrive on. Dribble penetration, slot cutting. Pick a roll happens, you tag, slot cutting. Yeah. It, it unlocked all that. And, and we all know how great D Wade is on the baseline. It's hard to cut behind the defense when X5 is standing there the whole time because, you know, the offensive of five is there. You know, so, you know, you hit me on the pocket pass now. You know, I get the pocket pass from, from Chalmers or, or from Norris Cole, you know, and now Bosch is in a strong corner. Are you going to leave him or not? If you do, he's going to tag you. And if not, when I roll, now you got X3 or X2 tagging on me on the roll. And nine times out of ten, that 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 guy that's playing the elbow that's supposed to X to the corner, he's Xing out to the three-point line and D-Wave slashing right behind him. It just it unlocked a, so much for our offense. And it gave myself and D-Wade in transition. We had this thing called the Mack truck lane. So from basically from the block to the block. So San Francisco, we sitting on the free throw line. Yeah. We got one block on one side, one block on this I side. I can picture a basketball court, yeah. We do it for the viewers. <laughs> I'm not questioning JJ's expertise. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. First day of training camp, we had that whole thing taped off. The bigs were not allowed to run in between the Mack truck lane. From the first day of training camp all the way to game one. Prohibited. You're not allowed to, you got to, and, and if I'm bringing the ball up, and the big is behind me, he can't cross the court. He has to run wide behind. This is all, this is all, Spo is like, he's, he's that damn good. Some Twitter sleuth will correct me on this, and I will accept it if I'm wrong. But in my mind, when I think of five out or delay, I think of the Miami Heat with Chris Bosh. As Maybe it wasn't the originator, but the first time I'm like, oh, this is, this is different and this is happening was the Miami Heat with Chris Bosh. Yeah. And sure. it changed everything. It changed everything. Changed the whole team. Changed the whole team. Then we added Ray. Shane. Added Shane. Added Mike Miller. We added the spacing. And CB could pass. He could rebound and push. There wasn't many fives at that time. That was rebounding and pushing the break. You see it all the time now. Right. You see Bam. Bam does it. Bam does it all the Yoke, time. Yoke, of yeah, course. Yeah, the MVP but, but. of the league. Yoke does it. It's like CB was pushing the break. Okay, if he ain't have nothing early in trans, boom, right to a DHO. Second side. Swing, swing. Like, he's, he was a smart, he was just smart. But, I mean, obviously, when you move 
from one position where you're so dominant. You think of CB in Toronto where he mainly played the four, almost probably 95% of the time played the four and averaged 25 and 10 or 12. The ball exclusively went through him in the mid post. Every single time. On either block, really. Yeah. But it's, it's remarkable that he changed that. Yeah, he changed that. I want to, before we talk more spacing, I want to touch on one last thing with the heat. And that is, I feel like in the NBA, the, the, the phrase super team or the, the term super team is, is a little bit, bit of a misnomer. Because you can have, you can have a big three, right? You still need four or five ancillary role players, absolutely, who star in their role, and then complement the stars. No question about it. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work unless you have those guys. It and does. you've lived it multiple times. I've lived it. I've lived it. I mean. Obviously, my, my first year in Miami, yeah, we had a big three. And everyone said it's a super team. Super team and super team net. But we had to build our team around all minimum guys, which was still okay. But we didn't fill out the complimentary guys enough. Yeah, we had Rio. We had Udonis. You know, but we didn't, we didn't have enough as far as enough complimentary guys to actually make it all work. And we still made it to the finals. We still made it to the finals, and we still probably should have won the finals, but I still give credit. You Listen, it is what it is. You you win and you lose, and we lost. There's no – Dallas was fucking good, and they hit, a, they hit a stride at the right time. Dirk was unbelievable. Um, but my second year, we was able to grab some complimentary players and role players that really just – I'm talking about super – superstars in their roles. And it goes back to my first year in Cleveland. My first year in Cleveland, yes, we got Kevin out of a trade. We lost in the finals. We wasn't really whole to unlock everything. We wasn't whole enough to unlock everything. Then we was able to add Channing Fry, add Richard Jefferson to that, to that second team. Yeah. Add those guys. And then the experience that we had from the year previously. You know, JR got better and shunk, yeah. you know, and obviously we were healthier, you know. Kyrie goes down in the finals with, you know, busted kneecap and Kev obviously separated yeah, sure. shoulder in year one. But you're absolutely right. The complimentary guys are ultimately the ones that will help you win the championship for sure. Yeah. And so, classified as a, as, a, as a real super team. Right. So I think, I think you know, the goal of, of this show is to really just like talk about basketball. Right. I love it. And, it, and it's great. And I love it. I love it. And I could do it all day. Yeah, me too. You know, I, we both live online. Let's be honest. We live online. <laughs> We're well aware of all the, the discourse. I, 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 I have to participate in the discourse. And, oh, and I, I said love, this. I, I want to participate so much know, more. I, uh, I, I, uh, I said this the other day. I was like, the discourse has a place, right? It provides yeah. a level of entertainment. Yeah. And I get it. And I, I feel like sometimes I get annoyed at a couple keywords that get involved in discourse. And we're not going to do this every episode. We're not going to, we're not going to do this, but I, I just, <laughs> on this point we're making yeah. about how a team works, yeah. there's, there's the, um, the word important. Who's the more important player for the Boston Celtics? Who's the most important player yeah. for the Boston Celtics? Um, I also get annoyed with the word pressure. Right, those are the two words that drive me fucking crazy. <laughs> Pressure in particular, because if you if you've like been around, you know that most guys in the NBA put an insane amount of pressure on themselves. Sure. That's why we all have fucking anxiety. <laughs> like we all put so much pressure on ourselves, and the important word bugs me. Because the best player is always the most important player. It's very hard to win in the NBA 
if the player who has the most outsized <laughs> impact yeah, isn't sure. at his yeah, best. Yeah, sure. And no offense, yeah, sure. 2011 is a great example of that. Yeah, I wasn't at my best. You weren't at your lost. best, and, and you I, lost. If I play right. anything like I did in the Eastern Conference Finals, we win. But you could have been at your best, and the role players could have been bad. So, like, for me, this is why I get annoyed. Because I'm like, yeah. Like, when I play on the Clippers, CP and Blake, they were the most important guys right. on our team. But DeAndre and I had a role. Jamal had a role. Matt Barnes had a role. Luke and Bob Mute the next two yeah. years had a role. Like, we all had an important role. And guess what? We put a lot of pressure on ourselves yeah. to actually play well and actually contribute to winning. Yeah. And I feel like we live in this fucking 2K world where we're like putting a roster together. And it's like, yeah. who can, how can we put as many good players that don't even make sense together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it drives me crazy. It's like, what's wrong with this team? Well, it's very simple. Basketball is a very organic thing. And the players and their skills have to complement each other. Have to complement each other. And Chris Bosch is a great example of that. The sacrifice to figure out how can my skills, and maybe I have to develop some of those, you mentioned the three-point shooting, how can I figure out how to complement? Right. It's going to make me better. It's going to make LeBron better. It's going to make D. Wade better. And it's going to make our team better. And that's basketball. And that's basketball. But, that's, but that also comes from, a, to go back to episode one, basketball IQ as well. Him having the basketball IQ and the knowledge of saying, yeah, I could still be in Toronto averaging 25 and 12, but I didn't come here for that shit. I came here to win championships. And we fucking lost in year one. What can I do to compliment my teammates? And what can I do to broaden my game out to where we don't lose in year two? Yeah. Fucking talk about growth mindset. And everyone's talking about, you know, Chris Bosh was this before that. No one ever asked Chris Bosh. No one ever asked Chris Bosh about how he feels. <laughs> everyone just speaks for him. Yeah. No one asked him how he feels. He knew he was making a sacrifice. We all knew he was making sacrifices. But we knew what the, what the fuck we all came together for, and that was to win championships. And that's what we did. I, I think... What's what's different about the playoffs? So, to your point about still winning a game, but maybe an adjustment's made late in the game, yep, yep. and you say we we won the game, but uh, they they may have figured something out, yep. right? I think what's different is if you make that adjustment with six minutes to go in the third quarter, and you come back, still lose the game. The next night, you might be playing Memphis. The next night, you might be playing Oklahoma City. The right. next night, you might be playing Portland. Right. So you might have to wait two months. Right. In the playoffs, you make an adjustment. You feel like you can exploit something. It's the same damn team. Same damn the team. The next night or same a personnel. day later. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You figure and you so that's something. where you see, like Dallas in 11. You remember J.J. Barea against the Lakers. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, they, they J.J. and Dirk in pick and roll. They, yep. they can't stop that. Yep. We're just going to exploit that over and over. Yeah. Um, what's your perspective on luck in the playoffs? Need it. You Give me an example. It. The biggest example of like luck in the postseason? In your, in your experience. Oh, in my experience. Uh, trying to think of my championship runs. I mean, I was on the team. That's the luck, right? <laughs> I can't think off the top of my head. But no, no, seriously. Like, like, you know, you could be a great team, but you need a little luck. You need the ball to bounce your way sometimes. You know, you need, a, you know, a, a certain player on the opposing team get in foul trouble. You know, it's just, I don't know. I mean, off the top of my head, I'm, I start to think of like, what, 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 unfortunately, what happened with Kawhi with the Zaza Pachulia thing. You know, I, the Spurs was... They were good. Yeah. They were fucking good. Yeah. And they were handling the shit out of Golden State up until that point. I think they were maybe up... I, I can't... I don't know off the top of my head. We can always look it up. Obviously, yeah. they were up 17, Yeah. you know, and they were very fucking good. And 
you know, you get Kawhi go down with the ankle and it's like, oh shit, the whole thing changes. It's, uh, you know, like I don't know off the top of my head as far as, you know, my experience, but you, luck, you want to say it's always you need, yes, you need it. You need some luck for sure. You definitely do. I think it goes back to where we kind of started this with the one play where a lucky bounce, an unlucky bounce, a call, mm. Uh, a guy reacting to something, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> An injury, right? A, a, a play, a, a moment. Play, a moment, right? yeah, for sure. And it's not, I think luck maybe is the wrong word. It's but not, But it's though. like an inflection point almost of like someone gets hurt. That can change shot. the trajectory yes. to the trajectory of, the, of, of what's, to, what's to come. Yeah. I mean, you look at, what is it, the 01 Lakers-Kings? I think that was game five or six, maybe. And they get the tip out to Big Shot Bob. Yeah. Like, no, everyone, I think Kobe, Kobe, missed, Kobe missed a floater over Doug Christie, I think. And then Shaq gets, and yeah, gets yeah, a tip yeah, out. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, Vlade, he's driving. Vlade tipped yeah, exactly. It out. Tipped it, it out. Right like, to Big, yeah, right to Robert Dory. Like, if you clean glass on that, that's that's the game. Yeah. And it's like, how many times a, a, a ball gets batted right into. One of the biggest clutch players in NBA history at the top of the key, and he just at the at the end of the game, bang bang. Yeah, that's, that's some luck. There's some luck to that. There's some luck to that. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching Mind the Game podcast. If you like it, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you.